You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Straight to Video Podcast with myself, Rob Lane. On today's show, it's great to be talking to one of this country's most talented musicians and he's a fairly local fella too. Coming up is a really fun and in-depth conversation with Darby's Paul Miro. Depending on how old you are or what kind of music you're into, you may have well crossed paths with Paul in one of his many geysers. If we're talking mainstream national level, then if you're a hard rock fan in the early to mid-90s, you may remember him as the lead singer for the alt-rock band Apes, Pigs and Spacemen, who for a few years you could not escape from in the pages of Kerrang. Their albums are a tour de force of alternative rock riffs, killer vocals and high energy, which still sound great today. But Paul has a very different flip side too. A lot of his musical output recently has been acoustic based and it's an arena where he really excels. Anyone who's seen one of his acoustic shows will agree, just the voice and guitar really is something special. That was how I was originally introduced to Paul. Back in the late 1990s I was playing in a derby band called Courtesan. Our singer Johnny is a massive fan of Paul's and had been following his career through all his various bands. John invited me to go and see him do an acoustic show in the small town of Matlock Bath and it was such a great night. Paul at the time was sporting this cool spiky red hair and just hearing him sing was unreal. Paul would later go on to do some amazing backing vocals on a courtesan song called Dust which we recorded a year or so after that gig and it was super cool to see him put his vocals down in the studio. We've stayed in touch ever since and I always look forward to what he's going to do next as it's always quality. He even provided a song for the Straight to Video album a few years ago which I was seriously humbled by because it just turned out great. Right now, Paul stays continually busy with studio work, either his own albums or writing music for film and TV. He's just completed the huge task of finishing and releasing a four-album concept project called Sonombre. The final piece of this musical journey titled Mortal Babies has just been released and you can track this down along with a vast catalogue of Paul's other music over at paulmiro.com. That's P-A-U-L-M-I-R-O.com. It was a lot of fun to chat with Paul and learn a lot about his past, He shares a lot of great stories of how he became involved in music and it's also really interesting to hear about a condition Paul has called synesthesia. I think I pronounced that correct, kind of in the ballpark anyway, where he sees sound in colour, which is mind-blowing. He also talks of his very early days of performing in bands and also when things started to really come to life with Apes, Pigs and Spacemen. I think if you're a fan of Miro, you're going to learn a bunch of new stuff and if you're new to Paul's story, then I hope it makes you want to hear some more. So here we go with my straight-to-video chat with Paul Miro. I've been doing this since I was a kid. I was like three years old when I when I started to love music and I took up music. There you go. That's my first question. <laughs> What's that? When did the music bug start coming in? Three. Yeah, I think it was probably before then, but three was when I went. I mean, my dad's an uh, amazing jazz drummer, so I used to go to loads of, of gigs as a kid. And when I was three, I wanted to play the drums. I wanted to be a, a great drummer. You know, that was it. It was just like brilliant. So... Went for lessons and quite a long while. And I was told, like, if you want to be the best drummer, if you want to do this properly, you need to be able to read the brass scores. You've got to phrase with, not think as a drummer, you've got to think about what all the other instruments are doing. And so to help with understanding the melody and stuff, I went to piano lessons for a shorter while than I anticipated because the guy was... Probably someone who'd be arrested quite quickly yeah. these days, Uh-oh. You know, but I didn't know how to tell my folks. And um, it was like, you know, guy used to squeeze your knee for the temple. Oh, man. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was that. So there were, we had um, we had this this really old guitar in our house that had four strings on it that you could walk under without ruffling your hair. You know, it's just like <laughs> manky strings. I didn't know any difference. So I learned to read drum score in relation to brass on this guitar thing. And then it all started from there, from about nine or 10, I started actually writing, I don't know if it'd be called songs, but I was hearing things inside the music that was not according to those rules that I was being taught, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And I didn't realize till much later, I, I don't know if you've seen any of the stuff I've said or written about, but I, I have a thing called synesthesia where I see sound in color. You mentioned that before. That's crazy. Yeah. It's just, I'm, I never understood it. I just thought everyone did yeah. it. And cause I was brought up wide array of music, the classics, there was jazz, there was, um, but there was blues. Yeah. And to me, this is the weird thing because guitars, they are varying shades of blue in my hearing spectrum, depending on what the tones are, what kind of instrument. They tend to be in the spectrums of blue as I see them. It's not like a, just a total line. Um, I sketched stuff out as lines, as ideas, but it's, it's just this blurry sort of thing that happens when the sound so guitars, when when this blues happened, when I was like, oh, yeah, this is the blues. And you're like, yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, it's like, it, it is because bass is dark blue to me. Bass has a, a rich, dark blue, upright bass as a, as a different kind of hue to an electric bass. So this whole thing was the bluest music. Yeah, quite literally. Yeah, 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 because it was predominantly guitars and bass. And, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd have like a Telecaster and a Strat or a Telecaster and a 335 and some guy playing a, um, a jazz bass or whatever. And so those three things were dominant and it was blue then, wasn't it? Yeah, the drums are red and the, and the keyboards are somewhere more in the yellow and magenta sort of yeah. region yeah. things. But yeah, it's the blues. That's right. Did you mention it to somebody thinking that was you thought that was commonplace? I know. I know it happened kind of early teens ish i can remember being with it would be school band type thing i've just got this thing this random thought there was this chunky lad whose name completely escapes me he used to play organ in the church he was like and it was like i want one of those organs it's like it's amazing but he had a you know like the old the the organs that used to play rhythms like yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. That, those switches that grandparents had on. He had one of one of those, and he and he played it. And I can remember that those those buttons were different colours. On you remember those those rocker switch things? They were different colours on them. There was like browns and yellows and oranges on them. You perhaps don't. I just it's, it rings a bell. <laughs> they had like draw bars, didn't they? Of like things that you pressed, and I can just remember there was this section that was different shades of brown. And I can just remember saying to him, like, no, they're the wrong colour. And him looking at me like, huh? Oh, what? Well, well, look, that's the colour it is on the organ, you know? And it's like, yeah, but they don't sound like that. And I, I can remember that being the first thing of, of like, oh, this guy doesn't get it. And realising perhaps it wasn't other people that were weird. How well known is that? It's pretty common. I think it affects something like 1% of people to various degrees. And it's not always the same you know you can have sound according to smell you can mm -hmm. have sound to numbers you can have sight to smell there's all kinds of the, the senses blur and with yeah. some people it's three things that trigger it and with some it's an emotional thing as well where you can have a sound that triggers a, a a smell that triggers an emotion and it's yeah it's quite um quite involved is it a, a blessing or a curse I, th I think it would possibly be a curse if i weren't a musician well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, I, then i wouldn't wouldn't get it at all but i think i guess i guess it's it's both it's more of a blessing than a curse because it's helped me it helps me when I've got ideas that I've not got the time to write down. I've adapted a sort of format now where instruments will have a certain shade. And so that I'll, I have this thing that I call the orchestra of my mind. And it's rarely that 
sometimes I'll just hear a melody. Sometimes it's a, a groove. Sometimes it's something simple and straightforward. But generally, I'm, I hear a lot of things. Yeah. Like, so if there's a vocal line, I hear lots of harmonies, and I will I'll, I'll hear guitar layers, and I'll hear strings, and I'll all these things will just flood into my head. And for scribbling down purposes, I've I've always got like um, I keep. Hey, there you hand. go. And so they're they're all my main colours for different instruments, and then I'll just scribble lines and with notes. Sometimes I'll put a bit of manuscript sort of things of if if it's not clear enough, but that's that works for me, you know. So from that point of view, it's a help. Things that make it a curse are when people improve their their computer programs. Like Logic is what I use as a um, DAW and. They now have fixed colours. Oh, shit. I was going to say that because you're almost ahead of your time because everyone puts the bars and stuff, but now it's, oh, shit. So you can't have, you know, like you've you've got that palette that will come up that allows you to select a colour. Yeah. But it's that colour. You can't go, you know what, that's that's really not the way that I'm hearing that uh, glockenspiel. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's a wrong shade. There's got to be a way to change it. Percussions and stuff that drives me mad because, you know, you'll probably sometimes have 15 or 16 different permutations of yeah. rhythms going on contrapuntally within a thing. And to me, every single one of those is a shade. Every single one of those is standing out if I close my eyes. It's, it's, it's got its stereo point. It's got its 3D point, And all of those spring out as colours. And putting them as pink on a on the screen is like, no. A whole nother level of OCD right there. It's Yeah, it's kind of OCD from the angle as well of there are certain things I can't do with my eyes open. And one of those was until, um, you know, like it, on Logic, if you're recording, it goes red as it's recording. I can't play guitar with red fucking flashing. In front of me. <laughs> it's the right color when I stop it. Yeah, yeah sure. But as it's recording, it's red. And you know, you you play, you're playing around, and I'll look up, and that red's there, and I'll go, "Whoa, no, that's not me." That's Unreal. so. Yeah, it's kind of like OCD, but it's disorienting. Um, and I can't play blue guitars. Can't play a blue guitar because it's wrong. So, are you? Did you grow up in Derby? Are you Derby born and bred? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. How much has it changed? Because I'm one of those people where you're obviously someone who stays indoors a lot and I'm like, stay indoors a lot. And I go into the city, I'm like, holy shit, where did that come? Everything's changing so much. Has it changed a lot since you were a kid? Just like you, I don't really, I don't really see it. I was, I'm from the Olveston end of Derby, which had, um, had a big park and a library and that's changed significantly. The streets themselves seem derelict and depressing as ever i've not really seen the town center is not a place that i've ever been a regular it's just like i go when i need to but yeah you know like that people start talking about new bars and new clubs and all of that and it's like don't even remember the one that was there before it, to <laughs> just be thinking the same thing. <laughs> oh really yeah fantastic yeah great is it good yeah yeah you should come down okay i used to know them more when there was a um, a healthier live circuit in the town, you know, places like 20th Century and the Blue Note and mm-hmm. when they were gig gigs, not kind of like fashion gigs, when they were places you could pull people in and stuff. That was, that was, um, I think we knew, I think we both knew the town better then, didn't we? Yeah. I mean, I was always, I'm like stuck right in between Nottingham and Derby. So I always saw Derby as kind of like an indie kind of town and Nottingham as the rock town, whereas yeah, not many yeah. like bands came out of Nottingham. Really. There's a few, but Derby always seemed to do all right. When I look back, because I was looking at bands which had like reasonable amounts of success from Derby and a friend of mine was big on the beyond in the early 90s. And... Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm, I still know Neil. I've not seen him for ages. Yeah, because they became Gorilla, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and you had Beekeepers, who you're obviously still in touch with Steve quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Jamie, yeah. Yeah, White Town, Bivouac. Most recently, there was Lost Alone and The Struts, all from like Derby Bay. So Derby's done all right for bands coming out of there. It has, yeah, it has. It's weird. Um, you, you'll get like, um, I think actors more than bands have come out of Derby as well. You know, there's been quite a few, and we've had quite a few kind of like the old school sort of, you know, our Bass Museum and all of that, and your Arkwrights and all that. It's yeah. been it's been a hub for things. Yeah, but I don't I don't know if it's ever been. 
it's, it's never got past what it is too easily. I think you've got, it's very much a local hero town, not from the bands you've mentioned, but but there's, there's certainly a thing where you will get bands who do really well in Derby, can't do anything outside yeah. of it. I think that's a, perhaps not unique, but I think it is very much a town like that of if you step one foot outside of Ashbourne, that's it, you're done. Um, no one will show up. But within that, there's, there's not a... Um, there's not a kind of cultural thirst amongst a lot of people. I think it's it's definitely renowned as a fold arms town. Okay. Impress me. I remember reading <laughs> a thing, um, this is going back a little while. I think it was Barbara Ellen in the Guard who used to be their kind of gig reviewer person. And I remember she came to see oh Welsh band. Wow, they were really big female singer. Catatonia. Catatonia. She went to see their end of tour show at the assembly room and the review was still one of the funniest i've ever seen because you're just there going oh man that is that is our town that is yeah. um, just say <laughs> like an entire you know how to how to choose the wrong venue to finish your tour you know like a thousand people standing with their arms folded going i'm not you're not as good as my mate's band and, <laughs> and, and, and it was like yeah there is there is an element of that about everyone's experience is different isn't it uh, we did as a uh, from the apes point of view awfully in derby it was terrible. really wow terrible we did um i think we got 15 people in the assembly rooms we did a thing where um the record label did this oh we're all playing our hometown so that's what's going to happen and we're all doing it and so we'd got a drummer from sheffield we'd got um two guys in sheffield at that point but laurie coming in on drums from London. So we've got London and Sheffield and we've got Leicester with Bar on bass and we've got me, Darby. And I'm all like, on your shoulders, mate. <laughs> Let's not do Darby, man. Let's not do it. And Sheffield we did the town hall and that sold out. And London we did then we did the garage and that sold out. And then we did the assembly rooms and it's like, look, you really don't want to be doing this. And they're like, it's the most expensive gig ever. <laughs> what did you do to all your mates in Derby, Paul? Where are you? I know. <laughs> I oh, know, but then we did. So the on the the same tour, we did Rock City and sold it out. So yeah. it's like you say, that divide of rock. Yeah, and and it was more indie. You know, it it kind of Derby had much more um, kind of affinity with the indie circuit. Yeah, and dance. You know, there's a lot of a lot yeah. of dance stuff came out of Derby. You know, like the um, oh god, the Square Dance Studios. You know, like quite a lot came out of that lot so going right back to early 90s isn't it so uh, what was your kind of progression of bands then when you first started did you start with friends or did you go to the depending on how old you was was you going into the music shops and putting up wanted ads or anything like that i worked in the music shop let me think this is i, I knew you're going to ask this and it's something i've been asked loads of times and i can never do a chronological map my first bands was as a drummer playing with grown-up jazz people but then as it progressed as it became things I wanted to do I know there were a couple of school bands one including the organist guy with the wrong colored buttons I wish I could remember his name he was a lovely guy and also while still at school I formed kind of fully original band that was weirdly through the shop because I was probably 12 or 13 and there was a like this grown-up guy with amazing biker hair who used to come in who played guitar and he had this massive smile Ian Lovett who's like just just loved the guy from day one and he was like I think he was probably 17 or 18 then and we got together for a jam and we ended up having our first sort of original band he was like super rock and roll and the thing is I, I think that was my first realization that my musical history point of view of getting introduced to different kind of sound was I, I had a neighbor which again this is, this just wouldn't happen now he was a lot older than me he had a motorbike I was nine years old knew his mum you know friends of friends one of those adults always open kind of thing and and Jeff my neighbor he used to play me music and just you know we'd, we'd play chess we play you know like it sounds so middle class we're real rough ass working class boys but we played chess and drafts and monopoly and all this kind of thing and he just had this great record collection and he introduced me to things like Thin Lizzy and Rank Zappa and Zeppelin and and you're just like this is mind-blowing amazing and 
Ian, I know when I met him and we were both like Lizzie fans and I'm just like this kid of going, oh yeah, I think Lizzie are awesome. So it was a thing of writing songs and Ian just smiled all the time. And I remember writing this song and um, him going like, what the fuck's that about, mate? And I'm like, oh yeah, well, it's about a guy who's like 90 years old and he's on a life support system and he wants to tell everybody to turn the machine off, but he can't, but all his memories keep running through his head. And he's like, uh, not Phil Lynner then. <laughs> <laughs> I realised then that perhaps my way of approaching <laughs> some from a lyrical idea wasn't ever going to engage a wide audience. Yeah. You know? <laughs> what was the name of the record, the music shop you worked in? It was called Wishes. Yeah. Originally, and then it became whatever else it, it was. Play it again, Sam. Okay, or, right, yeah. yeah. So originally that was called wishes yeah did you enjoy that i learned so much about instruments i learned met so many characters um like dixie kid who used to bring who he was uh, like one of these rogue importers who used to bring in fenders and gibson's and ovations and all this kind of thing and he used to take me all over the place of like all these things that really now you'd go I'm not quite sure if that's legal. <laughs> <laughs> it was just amazing. I guess like, you know, like because Richard Branson started out by doing dodgy deals on the, the coast with vinyl, didn't he? You know, it was that sort of thing. Just being at the docks when the things came in and ensuring that you'd got an extra kind of carton of a particular thing that was required so that you could make up more of them. Love it. Well, yeah, learned a lot. Don't Didn't regret moving on. I've only had one day job since. So you was playing drums. At what point did you progress to like guitar or was ever the front man thing the main goal? Ne- no, the front man thing, although I sang and I was in things at school, school plays and all that, I never really thought, of myself as a singer at that point the guitar thing uh when did it take over i would say i was about 12 or 13 ish and i was still learning the guitar as an accompaniment as something to assist my drum playing that's what i thought you know i had started writing songs melodies things with what i knew but my my fundamental knowledge of the instrument was really basic. It was still open chords. It was still kind of like, you know, doing that Barry F was a, a, like, whoa, I'm going to get that one day. And I remember, I don't know what his name was, but there was a guy who had a rock and roll band. I don't, I don't mean like our version of rock and roll. I mean, rock and roll teddy boy thing that he used to go out with. And I remember him asking if I'd, like to play guitar for him to depth for him and i was there thinking i know i don't know probably knew e a minor and b that was probably it maybe a seventh if i was lucky and um i'm like yeah okay i had a marshall 50 watt head and a 212 cab and i had oh i can't remember what make it was it was something like an avon les paul copy or something like that you know it stayed in tune once every third week in in Lent and I had a tuning fork that's how I tuned up (laughs) yeah that's how you tune up it was a G and I went out and played gigs with this guy and I was shit it was like just like worst guitarist in the world but I realized that if you did the moves on stage if you did all the like the Chuck Berry thing people loved it you know you never got it as a drummer I used to get patted on the head because I was so young as a drummer of like oh isn't he good and there was always the for his age thing but you did it with a guitar and was shit and people went that was amazing and you're going "Mm, something in this so I decided to get better at the guitar that was I think where it started taking over since I've been playing live in and around Derby during the late 90s particularly with Courtesan who I met John Hodgson who you're a good friend with you've been a big influence and someone I've looked up on when you first started gigging were there any bands or musicians where that guy's cool I want to follow that route. I want to do what he's doing or anything like that. It's again, that's a bit of a, you know, my, my answers are never straightforward. Oh, it's terrible. I've had kind of sounds where there's a kind of magic that someone's encapsulating or bringing about that. I don't wish to emulate as a player because I don't play their thing like John Coltrane, you know, like the sounds that that entire thing, the way that moved me inside, I went through a period of wanting to aspire to transfer that sort of emotional ah, to people through whatever I did. That that was a big one, John Coltrane, definitely. But there's there are just masses of 
like weird and obscure people like Lee Rittener, the guitarist. I don't know if you know who he is. Um, he, he's like jazz fusion yeah. sort of thing. He, from the point of technique and feel, melody, yeah, looked up to him a lot. There was uh, just loads of, do you know, like the big band stuff, all things like Count Basie okay. and all like that, Ellington. That goes back to, again, what the John Coltrane was, that energy, that something I can't put my finger mm-hmm. on. I wanted to be able to encapsulate that somehow. Yeah. And I think in a roundabout way, because I listened to so many wild and different sort of variations of music, they've all got mashed together. Yeah, that's probably the best way because no one can yeah. pinpoint it to like, that's that, that's that, that's kind of yeah. amalgamation. I think, I mean, I can definitely say where life changed. That's like, like my sister was boy bands of the time thing and we had one turntable in the house of, uh, that we shared and it's in her room i think there were three artists who definitely shifted everything for me first one was um alice cooper right which was neighbor jeff and um he played me schools out and it was like this is the best album ever that was a kind of i want to be like this i want to be in this band yeah. because that one is the best band and then what really blew my mind was when my sister met my future brother-in-law martin because it was kind of like then i had access to the record player you know i, I could play it she was going out with him you know and he came around with the entire bowie collection amazing and that was like unreal i went through it chronologically from going back to the Derham years when before he was David Bowie when he had the curly perm and all of that just went through the lot and I think that was possibly a year of my life I just don't remember because it was just one gobsmacking moment yeah. after another and I still every Bowie album up to Scary Monsters still does and including Scary Monsters does that to me still to this day of like wow that was incredible Zappa, got to admit, that's a similar thing. But the other one that really made me, I guess, on that whole, I guess, the concept idea thing was was Floyd yeah. combined with Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. Those were massive, saw them more as cinema music yeah. more than, you know, like the you grew up with vinyl. Vinyl was an experience beyond sound, wasn't it? You know, like gatefold sleeve. The lyrics being there, there was the smell, there was the feel, the whole like the, the ah, it was it was immersive on a way that an MP3 can never be. And I think the Wall and the um, War of the Worlds were albums that, to me, peaked on that yeah. level of fully absorbing the visuals of what they were saying. So. I guess they were massively influenced. Yeah, I mean, you've picked some of the most visual artists of all time. They're Alice Cooper, David Bowie, Pink Floyd, and then you've got War of the yeah, World yeah. soundtrack. Mash all them together and it's you're unstoppable from there, really, for sure. Well, I thought that with Sonombre because that's what I've tried to write. But yeah. Exactly, yeah. Was that kind of your blueprint for Sonombre, do you think, then? That kind of feel or something you've always had inside you that you wanted to do? I've always wanted to do a dystopian concept thing. Yeah. I didn't envisage it being on this scale, not four albums. I thought I always wanted the double album gatefold. To me, it's vinyl in my yeah. head. And I wanted it to be a thing where not only was it gatefold out, but it was gatefold up and down. And you had this whole thing telling the story within these four panels. Yeah. That was a long, long time ago. But the actual Sonombre concept itself didn't properly transpire till 2014 and then it was going to be a double album Mm -hmm. as i started writing it it was like nah this is bigger than that and obviously we've ended up with rather a lot more do you have any fond memories going back to playing around derby uh john again because he's kind of key to me getting to know you and all this kind of stuff he used to lend he used to lend me live cassettes of um straight razor halo stuff Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Probably stuff you ain't even got as well. <laughs> Most likely. Don't tell everyone that because then like, I'm going to get start getting things and go, oh, where did you do that? Oh, no. Where did that band sit on the career timeline? Was it just prior to Apes? Yeah, there was there was so much going on around that time. Right. So let me try and get this straight. There was an original Straight Razor Halos that I think was a Sheffield band. It was Rob Clark, Dutch on guitar and Barry Holt drums. That was the original Straight Razor Halo. 
which was super dark and gothic and weirdly enough song subject matter as close to the San Ombre thing as anything I'd done um, until now. And then that kind of transformed into the Derby straight Razor Halos. And during that period, I was working with, there's the candy flip thing happened around that time. So I was doing that. And um, then how the apes came about was there was a guy from Leicester called Carl Swan who contacted me, I think via a publisher or something uh, through Sheffield and said he wanted to co-write some songs. He was looking for a co-writer for songs. And we got together and the band that he had, had Bart in on bass okay. and Bart and myself went to the pub a couple of times without the rest of that band. And we were like both into real similar sort of things that, you know, like we're bringing out random bands like Clutch, oh Clutch, yeah, they're fantastic. And you're just coming out with all these bands that we had in common and then going back further and all of the 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 jazz funk and the the kind of fusion stuff and it's like oh wow yeah this is this we ought to we ought to kind of have a jam so bart brought his friend rob in on guitar who's still one of the finest guitarists i've ever met he was on guitar and we had no drummer and then we auditioned for drummers over a period of time and we brought in sam and all of us had had different varying experiences with record companies and management and all that sort of thing. So the whole thing with the apes was we were just going to make music that we really enjoyed that we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And around that time as well, I was working for Count Casimir Belinsky III in, I can't remember where we went. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can. It was Barry Barlow from Jethro Tull Studio. He had that place block booked forever and I became his singer songwriter right right. it's the most surreal radio four comedy series you'll never hear (laughs) so whilst i was with bart and the lads i was spending five days a week down south and henley on thames writing with this guy and incidentally through that the keyboard player in that outfit was a guy called richard young who went on to become really good friend and he played keyboards on the second Apes album, on the Snapshot album. So you see why I can't remember it in order. <laughs> so many things. Yeah, so the Straight Razor Halos thing kind of dissolved at the end of or during the Candy Flip thing because the Candy yeah. Flip thing got really messy, um, not least because of me. Um, I was in a bit of a mess, not just through lack of money. <laughs> Let's say it was a period when drugs were very good. Yeah. Then, yeah, so that kind of areas a bit gray to me and apes sort of came out of that but we had no name we changed our name every gig we just sort of let's see what happens and yeah. then we got labels started coming to us and things and it were not interested and um went from there to us signing what was the vibe at the gigs and stuff could you feel something kind of when labels get interest what's thing could you feel like a change a shift in yeah, like yeah. audiences and reactions and stuff like that we went from kind of just playing mates venues yeah to saying all right we're gonna i can't remember any of the names of the venues i know there was the one that does fly is the squirrel at dinnington because that was like a a rock legend little it was like what a working men's club sort of thing yeah and the reason i remember that is someone contacted me about it a few weeks ago and it's like oh wow how can you forget that but that was a a benchmark thing because we used to do that on these four or five band bills you know the the kind of like yeah today just throw a pound yep. and they've got a million bands all using each other's <laughs> gear and <laughs> bring your own snare and yeah. hats all the amps frigging melting by yeah, the end of the day. that's the one yeah yeah it's gonna hold out one more set one more set yeah horrible we i can remember there was a kind of shift we went from doing that on the five band bills to it being a whatever our name happened to be on any specific time that on the posters and us making shirts and selling loads of shirts and also selling loads of cassettes and actually looking and going do you know what we can kind of tick over as a band on what we're selling it yeah sort of thing and we were funding our own recording and we were got vehicles we've got things operating bart still had a day job but the rest of us were there going this is kind of 
ticking over you know we, yeah. if we couldn't make this and i think it would have just stayed there but that was that point we'd been together for i think it was 91 when bart and i first met and i think it was possibly tail end of 92 when we noticed there was a shift and then very shortly after that phone started ringing and you'd got people interested in managing it you got wanting to sign you and give you studio time and all yeah. this kind of thing and um and then it just so happened we signed the worst deal on the table because it seemed to offer us freedom, you know, that yeah. was six weeks after signing, because we were there, like, we got offered, there was East West, there was A&M, there was Sony, uh, I think there was one other biggie who were all, oh, Roadrunner, they were looking as well, but there were a lot of potentially big label deals on that would have been wage, that would have been lots of new gear, that would have been... You know, paying for a hairdresser. It, our thing was, well, look, we've got material. We came together as a band to do the material how we want to do it. We'd met a producer who saw exactly that and was able to capture it, Simon F for me. Mm-hmm. So our thing was, we can make an album relatively cheaply, pretty quickly, and we can go out and we can tour it tight as a gnat's chuff because it was a band that was rehearsing five, six days a week. Solidly, it was so tight and incredible. Then the... Um, whole thing was music for nations was the only one who was going to you make the album the way you want to make it and that's why we right. started. but literally weeks after that had a um had dinner with um jerry cantrell and he <laughs> sat there and, and him like all right so you, you just signed this deal with like yeah he's like mm, okay and uh I, I, I'm trying to change the subject and uh, he's going like you do realize you fuck don't you and you're like well Okay, and you're there thinking, well, shit, I'm not having that. You know, we've just done this and we're going to be doing this and we're going to be touring the world and we're going to be, you know, like, and his analogy, which still to this day is the best way of summing it up and still represents where I am, if you like, as an artist, but on a much smaller scale. He says, look, we are signed to a, a huge corporate label. Mm-hmm. He said, I've got property, I have a Porsche, all of that's irrelevant. Okay, I keep that, whatever happens. But the bottom line is, I'm your Texaco garage. Our music is Texaco garage. You want gas, you go into any Texaco garage, you get gas, you don't ask, you're not looking, it's there. Everyone knows what everyone gets. It. And he says, you're making homebrewed gasoline that's possibly much better but you've got to go round to every garage in every country neighborhood and knock on their doors and ask them people have got to know it's there and people have got to want it and people have also got to accept that it's going to cost more than the texaco stuff that they can get anywhere and you're like wow and that's yeah uh, they kind of drilled it home yeah that was like eye opener of yeah epic precaution proportions even not yeah <laughs> just revisiting some of this stuff before i spoke to you and everything do you think it was kind of like a perfect storm because you guys had like it there was that whole shift in the music industry around that time with let's say the seattle scene and all that kind of stuff and your sound it i'm not saying it's of that sound but it kind of slotted into that kind of ilk but i don't think you was a band who was writing to that kind of genre if you like because you listen to your voice it's perfectly suited for it but you can just hear your influences straight away you can hear the tom waits you can hear the david bowie you can hear let's say mark Patton from faith no more yeah i'll take that compliment okay thank you you're not trying to sing like those bands but it kind of sits in there as well so that's why i was using the term of perfect storm like you came out at that time when everything else was kind of revolving around a similar kind of orbit i don't know i've i think maybe if you'd asked me this a, a while ago, um, I, I think I probably spent a lot more time trying to analyse what went wrong. I'm just trying to think more about what went right. In a way, what went in, right? Yeah. Um, well, I don't think I don't think anything did go right. No, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking prior to the <laughs> signatures and all that kind. Because there was, you say, there was a buzz. There was people, record labels getting interested, crowds getting interested. Yeah, yeah. I think probably. I think you're probably right. I think also one of the things that was different was we were an English band. Yeah. Singling about English issues. There's always been a political element to what I write, as you. As you know, um, and I think some songs like Come Around the World With Me while very international, but it's spoken as an Englishman singing about domestic mm-hmm. violence in the context of a of a rock song in an English way. I, I think there was an engagement with people because it was you were talking about a very toxic situation in politics where people were crying out for change, where there was protest building. I'd like it to be like that right now because it's even more toxic. 
there, there, there was something bubbling where people were very discontent. So I think with all of those elements of, yeah, there, there was, my voice did fall into that, mm-hmm. if you like, that grunge scene because of its roughness. Its Englishness was there as well. It had range, yeah, fine, all of that. But it was a band which was, it had the groove in spades of a kind of I was I was gonna I mean they're not they're not a band I I'm really a massive fan of but Flea with rhythm section was funky as anything on Blood Sugar Sect Magic I still you know I still think that that is a a great album um I don't wish to go down the oh the Chili's a great band kind of route because they've made a lot of things that obviously aren't so good but it had all of that element of crowd moving from the point of mosh pit it had the rage against the machine screams in your face of people coming back plus i just think there was a chemistry between band and audience that just spread there was a there was that feeling of oh they're playing let's go and see them it's a right laugh and we had to me it was more like one of the first bands i ever went to see was acdc when bon cool. scott was there and i mean like a super kid but seeing which you know people do not remember that bon scott used to be able to get on angus's shoulders and go in the crowd you know because it's like their stadium band you know that was mind-blowing just like carrying on playing radio pack again yeah. like what's that thing he's walking miles without his guitar plug coming through the crowd and everybody feeling like they'd connected yeah. with this guy that's what i think it felt like from the apes point of view if you felt like you were doing that somehow i i don't know there was something there was a, a magic yeah. that felt like it was ready yeah. to be built upon that you know obviously went sour very quickly I, I never understood, you know, like let's put these let's put this band on tour with bands they are nothing like whatsoever. It was who did you see as kind of your contemporaries then at that time who you perhaps would have liked to tour on at a bigger scale? We were offered uh, the Primus tour, but um, MFN wouldn't pay for it. Uh, we were offered the Body Count tour. That would have been just like unbelievable. But believe it or not, this is great. I've got to say it. And if he's listening, I'm sorry, but it's true. You did it. Rob, the guitarist, the original guitarist in the Apes said, because he was in a club band. That's how he earned his, his money. He said, oh, yeah, I can't do these dates. And John, who was managing us at that point, John Brand, who managed Stereophonics and things, he, he, he said in jest, like, all right, so if we can get a dep on that, you'd be all right with you. And, and Rob's like, yeah, yeah, that sound. That's how we didn't get the Body Count tour. And there were there were a couple of other bands of, of an alternative rock persuasion that I'm not going to say anything about, but they were they were sort of the right target. If you know what I mean? The more alternative yeah. than mainstream sort of thing. Um, Warrior Soul wasn't too bad a match, yeah. to be honest. That wasn't too bad a match because they changed what they were doing. And also it was a complete and utter laugh. <laughs> Superb. Finally, to wrap things up, if you could sit down and write with any of your influencers or heroes, who do you think will be the most interesting? Tom Waits. Yeah, without Still, a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. I don't know whether it's rose tinted spectacles. I don't know what state he's now. There was a guy who, who first played me, Tom Waits. I don't remember his name, but it was one of those things where you're moving from house to house, sort of thing. You go around, and this and this guy has got Tom Waits' Asylum Years. Sat down and listened to that, and that for me was the ultimate in songwriting. It was just like I have never. I've never cried so much on a first listening and with people there in the room, yeah. you know, you'll get songs that do this thing to you. I don't know if you've got that, but there'll be certain things where I don't know what happened there, but well, a bit like the dog dying at the end of the film, isn't it? You know, yeah. but the, Tom Waits has a, a magic of arrangement can do that in spades. And I just think to be together with, the guy with just a few drinks, a piano, a guitar, a couple of mics. I just would love to see what would happen. Yeah. Would you dare present any ideas to him or would you just wait for him to ask you? <laughs> I, I would definitely, but I, it, he's like, he's a guy who'd just go, yeah, just whatever, man. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You had an idea. Well done. <laughs> I don't think it, I don't know. I can't envisage how it'd ever work. I just kind of, I guess like 
a, a, a Hitchcock movie or a, a sort of Casablanca kind of thing where you're two guys who happen to collide and you, you it's got to be a sort of it's got to be a lost weekend setting where you're in a hotel where there's not instruments but you can manage to sort of do something that you go you know and then what would be the ultimate is if nothing came out of it whatsoever but you go away going man that was an awesome weekend yeah I don't know I that's yeah that's the first thing that springs to mind I guess there's loads of musicians I'd love to work with personally I just want to be able to keep making music that's yeah. that's the for me the biggest privilege the biggest kind of sense of being yeah privileged is to be able to create and complete ideas Paul thank you very much for doing this I've loved it all right bud it's been a lot of fun always good to catch up always mate always you take care, Paul, and I shall and speak you, to you soon. All righty. Take it easy. See you, man. Thanks so much to Paul Miro for being so open and honest during our chat. He really is one of the guys I look up to, regardless of him being a local musician. He's just so great. His talent is pretty dang inspiring. Please check out all the recent Sonombre albums, which can be found over at paulmiro.com. And I hope we get the chance to see Paul perform live again sometime soon. To you guys, thank you for the lovely support over the past couple of months. I've had a lot of really supportive and nice comments and messages recently, so thank you for that, and it's nice to know things are on the right path. But don't worry, I've got a lot more to come. So for now, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Straight to Video podcast. I've been your host, Rob Lane, and I look forward to speaking to all of you again real soon. <laughs>